chapter 8, verse 14. Mark chapter 8, verse 14. I guess the Lord might be in this message. What Max prayed, Lord, a lot of us are broken, so will you please heal us? I think God is about to answer that prayer with an unexpected answer. Let's look at Mark chapter 18. And we'll look at verse 14. Mark chapter 18. We'll look at verse 14. The passage is about the disciples when they went out with Jesus to, <laughs> to partake in a meal with Him. And then all of a sudden while they were eating their bread, Jesus Christ suddenly said, you know, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And then the disciples, they got very uh, confused and they said, why in the world would Jesus tell us to uh, beware of bread? You know, we're eating bread right here, which is uh, unleavened bread. But actually, at verse 19 through 21, Jesus Christ, he mentioned to them that it's not, I'm not talking about the bread that we're eating right now. Yeah. Did you forget about the 5,000 yeah. that I provided a huge miracle mm -hmm. where I broke the bread and divided the portion and gave it to everybody? And then the disciples later realized, oh, so uh, Jesus Christ, he's not talking about literal bread itself. He's telling us to beware of the bread of the Pharisees. Wrong doctrine. So let's look at verse 14. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye, because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes see ye not, and having ears hear ye not. And do ye not remember? When I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They said unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? Jesus Christ is questioning these disciples. Don't you remember the bread that I broke and then I spread it out to feed thousands of people. And the disciples said, yes. And then Jesus Christ says, how is it that you don't understand? Later on, they found out he was referring to avoid the bread or the wrong doctrine of the Pharisees. But the importance right here is that Jesus Christ, he's telling them, how come you don't understand what I'm talking about? Don't you recall the times where one piece of bread where I broke it and fed thousands and I think that a lot of us just like the disciples fail to understand that that even though with small amounts and broken portions the Lord uses broken things to create a miracle of feeding 5,000 people in your life yeah. 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 and I think the problem with many of us today is that when we go through broken situations it is very easy to see the broken pieces rather than the master behind the broken pieces, rather than the power behind the broken pieces, rather than the current situation of the broken pieces and seeing the future of what the broken pieces yeah. could be. And I hope that today's preaching, that it will speak to those who are broken today. And I feel that there are broken people who need a miracle. The title of my message today is Broken to Become a Miracle. Father God, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood. Father God, I come to you truly broken today, and perhaps I need to be broken even more. I don't know. For you to get greater glory and the glory that you deserve. But this is all I can do, Father, and you're just going to have to do whatever you can through this broken piece of dirt. Thank you for using me time and time again. My life is literally a miracle. This church is a miracle. Having worship here together is a miracle, despite of how many times the devil had tried to attack. And I pray that you will get the glory today. Yes. May people get convicted, lives change. Speak to the broken. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 To the broken, I want to say that the first point is safety. Safety. Why did God break you? 
to protect you. That sounds very contradictory, does it not? Why did God break me? It's to give you safety. Why did God break me? Why does God want harm in my life? It's to prevent you from going through harm. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 38, please. Isaiah chapter 38. For some of you who are not familiar with this story, the story is about King Hezekiah who was about to die. And he was going through a broken health situation. And Hezekiah was greatly worried and afraid. And he wanted to be cured. He wanted to be freed from this broken health. So he begged the Lord. And actually the Lord answered his prayer and took away the broken health from his life and cured him. Look at Isaiah chapter 38, verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, <coughs> Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. If you can picture yourself being King Hezekiah, you would be happy. You would thank the Lord that he freed you from that broken situation and that he healed it and then got rid of the problem for you. But my, 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 look at chapter 39, verse 1 through 6. Chapter 39, verse 1 through 6. I'm not going to read everything, but if you read, look at verse 1, people from Babylon came to visit King Hezekiah. Then at verse 2, Hezekiah foolishly showed those Babylonians everything that he had in his kingdom. Then at verse 3, Isaiah was questioning Hezekiah why he, what was going on. And then at verse 4, Hezekiah answered that, well, I showed off to the Babylonians everything that I had in my kingdom. And then verse 5 and 6 and 7, Isaiah said, because you've done this foolish thing, the Lord is going to actually rend and ruin your kingdom. Now think about it. Hezekiah doomed his entire kingdom because of his foolish action. But what would have prevented his foolish action is Isaiah chapter 38. What was it, Pastor? He should have died. If he allowed God to use that broken health and to take him home to heaven, he would not have committed that foolish action and ruined his whole kingdom and his whole future. Why did God give me this broken situation to prevent you from doing something foolish in the future so that you would hurt yourself, so that you would hurt your family, so that you would hurt your loved one. You would hurt the church and other people around you. And that's the reason, brother and sister in Christ, you must realize that God, when He allows a broken situation in your life, it's to provide you safety. It's so that you don't get into trouble. How many times have you went through broken situations? You went through a broken family, a broken marriage, a broken health, a broken future, a broken job, and that rescued you from going down a path where you would have committed greater sin and damaged yourself and where the devil, the world, and the flesh would have taken opportunity for you. Yeah, that's yeah. good preaching, brother. Yeah. Amen, brother. Thank you, Lord, yes. for the broken. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the broken. You know what the miracle is? I'll tell you the miracle. You're alive. Yeah. That you, God is still using you. Yeah. Amen. You should have been shot down to hell a long time ago or yeah. died and That's went right. to heaven. Right. Amen. That's right. Why? God broke some of you and some of you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Some of you yeah. know which broken situations yeah. the Lord allowed in your life. Yeah. Yes. And that saved you. Yeah. And you're a walking miracle today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. There was a man who saw a cocoon, and then the insect inside the cocoon, that cat caterpillar, 
was trying to become a butterfly, but the cocoon was wrapped and so tight. And then there was a little small opening where the wings stuck out. But guess what? That butterfly, that caterpillar that was trying to morph into a butterfly was stuck and could not get out and it tried to budge. The man out of mercy, not spite, not meanness, what a nice guy. He wanted to help the butterfly. Took a little scissor and just made a little bit more of a snippet so that that opening can become a little bit bigger. Out of mercy that he's done for that butterfly, it became the butterfly's doom. The butterfly became a cripple the rest of its life. Why? The tightening force of the cocoon was absolutely necessary to force in the fluids into the wings so that the wings can develop greater strength. And so that the butterfly can come out and flap its wing freely and enjoy life. God, be merciful to me. Deliver me from this broken situation. Why are you so mean? Because if he met down to your desire of mercy, yeah. it would not be mercy, yeah. but cruelty. Yeah. And your wings cannot flap as a butterfly. And you'd be crippled for life and hurt and broken. And God, out of divine safety and care for you, my child, he decided to not give that little snippet and free you from that cocoon, but just let you struggle and let you suffer and let you just go through the force and the force of the hurt. Mercy, Lord! Mercy! And God says, I'm giving you mercy. Set me free! Give me mercy! And God says, I can't set you free because I'm a merciful God. Why didn't God rescue me from this health crisis, family crisis, the current crisis I'm going through? Because He's merciful to you, my child. And He loves you. And He says, because I'm merciful. And I'll let you cry every night and grieve my heart. I'll let you whine and think dark thoughts. I'll let you grieve the Holy Spirit. And I'll let you blame me because out of mercy, I'm going to let you go through the pain to protect you. Thank you, Lord. What a loving heaven. Yes. Yes. Amen. My second point is salvation. Salvation. You know what the miracle is when you go through a broken life? Is that that broken piece of you somehow converted the hardest of hearts. Why? Because the hardest of hearts, who's your family member or a best friend or a lost loved one, who's dying and going to hell. That hard heart needs to be broken. Yeah, yeah. And what needs to be broken is you need to be that broken piece to shatter that hard heart. That's a miracle. Have you seen testimony after testimony of intellectuals, of stubborn people, people who despise Christianity, yeah. but then they got saved because of a broken, run-down yeah. individual yeah. who's suffering a health problem or cancer? And testified his or her life and showed them the love of Jesus Christ and how to get saved. Amen. Philippians chapter 1 verse 12. It magnifies, but I would ye should understand, yes. brethren. Understand. Yes. Yeah. Understand what? That the things which happen unto me, oh, it hurts. I'm broken. The things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance. Wow. Of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Tell me if you're a hard hearted individual and you're a high intellectual and you had all the answers and nothing is going to make you budge in Christianity, that you were that doctor which happened a couple, 200, maybe 300 years ago, and you sat in front of that dying individual who was looking at you. And who is going to pass away. And he was going to go into eternity. If you are that hard hearted individual. And a lost sinner headed for hell. And nothing on heaven and earth would make you budge. Tell me if you were that individual. Past two or three hundred years ago. You saw that dying individual smiling. Looking up to heaven. Eyes gleaming. And then he looked at you. And he said glory be to God. I shall soon be with Jesus. And that man's name was Billy Bray. 
and he looked at that man and he said, Doctor, I'm going to go to heaven with Jesus. Shall I give him your compliments and tell him you'll be coming too? Wow. That doctor, a couple hundred years ago, tears was welling up in his eyes. Unbeliever, seeing a believer's death. A believer's death, which had more joy than an unbeliever's life. That's right, yeah. And that believer, he kept crying out, Glory be to God, I shall soon be with Jesus. When I go down to hell, I will keep shouting glory all the way and make the, the bottoms of hell ring and the bottomless pit out comes out the devil and he will say, Billy, Billy, this is no place for thee. Get thee back up to heaven. Yeah. And up to yeah. heaven, I will go and shout glory, glory, glory. And that man... If you were that unbelieving doctor who saw Billy Bray die, just keep shouting, glory. 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 Let's see you reject Jesus Christ after yeah. that. Yeah. Thank God. He broke you. Why? To finally convict your lost mom about her lost Thank condition. You, to yeah. finally convict Thank your you, dad Lord. that all the failures in job opportunities, school opportunities, and in life, how God turned it all around and put you on top. To convict your friends around you who sought after the world and they ended up with divorced lives, broken children, and the world can never satisfy and being scared of the coronavirus. They see your broken life where you sacrificed all the world and you got the joy of the Lord and got something that they don't have. Amen. He broke you. Why? To convict that one that you've been praying for for the past one year, two year, three year, yeah. four year, five year. Amen. God, answer my prayer. Get them saved. Then God says, I am. Be broken. And he takes that hammer and shatters you. And says, there's your answer to prayer. That's good. My third point is strength. Strength. You know why God broke you so that you can become a miracle? To make you strong. Yes. Why? You will always be weak if someone coddled you. That's right. You will always be weak when someone tries to keep making you comfortable. Yeah. You will always be weak and never learn to overcome a problem. And you will become dependent on situations or people. And God forbid your pastor and God forbid people here because we can sin and we can let you down. Yes, yes. Right. And then when God does not let broken situations happen and let you be comfortable, rich, and happy, and dependent, then you become weak and frail. And when the devil sends in one little bad thing, you just become so pathetic and sad and you fall prey. Good preaching. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 3. You know what it reads right there about suffering? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. You know how patience or other great elements of strength come out? When God has to try you. Yes, yes, and when He tries you, He's breaking you. Yes, thank you, Lord. Why is He breaking you right now? To make you stronger. Thank you, Lord. You know, when a mother eagle builds her nest, the babies come out all frail, hopeless, and sad, and you into a born world. How can a baby eagle that looks so frail become the mighty, grand, strong eagle? I mean, how are you going to create an eagle like that with this frail little baby that you look at? And the, that mother eagle, she makes the nest very soft and comfortable and coddles and cares for her. Uh, young little babes and then she lines the nest with a thick padding of wool feathers and fur from animals that she has killed so that the eggs can be soft and warm and that the babies can come out well and then the the birds those little chicks you can see those little eagles they just get so comfortable and happy and being cared for the mother and then suddenly the mother, she tries to grab away one padding of wool away and then another piece of fur away. And then the 
young birds are getting very uncomfortable. The young bird has become very dependent for a long length of time now. It's been days and weeks and the months where that young baby bird has become so dependent upon that nest that it would not even budge. It would not even fly. How can you convince that young baby bird to fly? The mother eagle made the nest uncomfortable so that there is no comfortable place for that baby eagle. And with no comfortable place to depend upon, the comforts being taken away from the young eagle, the young eagle finally takes out its wings and flaps and flies away and looks at the beauty and the wonder and sees his own independent strength to fly. And that's what my friend God is doing to you where Jesus said that I am just like that mother hen that gathers the chicks underneath her wings. And Jesus Christ cares for you, loves you, and caresses you. And you become so dependent on the blessings of God. He's given you good people in this church. He's given you blessings. He's answered your prayers. He made life better for you. But now... God says it's time to fly and he started to take out one blessing away from you and you start to say like Job the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away blessed be the name of the Lord and then God just took out one piece of animal fur right there and then took another comfort from your life and then took a soft feather out of there and took another blessing out of your life took another comfortable thing in your life took another thing that you were dependent upon that you needed for your life and then something that made you happy for your life and made you so comfortable God took it away why? So that you can spread your wings and fly! Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know why? God broke you. Flap your wings. You let them down. You've been too comfortable. You've been fat. You've been sitting on your blessed assurance. You've been so happy and just feeling rich and comfortable. And those wings have never flapped. They never worked. They never flew to see what you could become, what you could be. You need to become strong. Why should I become strong? You want to be that baby bird stuck in that nest forever? What if that happened? What if the eagle never took away the comfort? What would become of that baby bird? Some of you are still sitting on that nest. Weak, frail, and it's only a matter of time that some predator can climb up that tree yeah. and eat you. Yeah. And some of you are probably getting eaten up right now. Mm. And that's the reason why God's telling you to fly! Fly! My fourth point is support. Support. You know why God broke you? So that the simple dumb you that you are, I don't know about you, but I'll tell you what I am. I'm stupid. I'll tell you what I am. I'm a sinner. I'll tell you what I am. I don't know about you. you you're probably a great guy. But I'll tell you what I am. I'm just a dunce. I need that point of cap, Brother Robert. I am frail and I am wicked. Amen. And I am a nothing. Amen. Amen. And if you saw me 10 years ago, how I talked, how I acted, how my knowledge was, then you would laugh at me today what I am now. But God used this simple life of yes, mine yeah. Yeah. to become a miracle to many people Amen. worldwide. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And that's not a miracle, then I don't know what is. Yeah, yeah. Why, Pastor? Because he broke me for the past 10 years. And he's breaking me now. And he's breaking you now. And you've been broken for years. Why? So that you can make miracles. Amen. To what? Support many people around the world. To support other lives around you. Me? My life? A blessing to Brother Max? How am I a blessing to you, brother? I do not understand that. That's a miracle. Yeah, yeah it is. You know why God broke you? 
so you can support the person yeah. sitting right next to you. Yeah. No, I got broke you so that you can support somebody that you have no idea who's far away from you. No, I got broke you so that you can become a support. Second Corinthians chapter one verse six says, "And whether we be afflicted." If we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Amen. Bible is clear. You suffer so that you can become a blessing yeah. to yes. somebody else. Praise the Lord. Yes. David Brainer was a man of untold sufferings. Went through the rough life of a missionary. That man, he gave up everything at the age of 18. Gave up worldly pleasures. Gave up his future career. Gave up what he could be. He went to some Ivy League schools. And he had the genius. And then he had potential. And that man said, I'm going to sacrifice for Jesus. And I'm going to become a missionary. And that man, he gave it up, man. He gave up all the prosperous stuff, all the good stuff. Turned his life around. Can you imagine a life of regret that he should have faced as a missionary where he was coughing up blood? And he always lacked suitable food and his health was horrible. Constantly exposed to hunger and the cold. Getting lost in the forest. And he only brought small results in his ministry work. Didn't get a lot of money, didn't get a lot of people in his church, and didn't get a lot of credentials, and didn't get a lot of praise, and he wasn't a great speaker invited to any conferences. He was just a nobody out in the middle of the woods saying, what am I doing here? Imagine some person like that, you know. I'm called to preach, and you gave up the job, and gave up uh, everything prosperous in his life to be what? You find him in the middle of the woods getting lost and miserable, coughing up blood, and he's going, what am I doing here? You would think, man, that man made a mistake. Come on, preacher. I would. I would. One incident relates, quote, about six at night, I lost my way in the wilderness <clears throat> and wandered over rocks and mountains through swamps and most dreadful places. I was pinched with cold and distressed with an extreme pain in my head and stomach so that much blood came from me. But God preserved me, and blessed be his name, such fatigues and hardships as these seem to wean me more from the earth, and I trust will make heaven the sweeter. Wow. What an attitude. Yes. What a heart. Yes. I don't know any of you today that just said that to me today on Sunday. I don't see this pastor telling you that today, this morning. He died in his early 20s, and he was engaged to Jerusha Edwards, Jonathan Edwards' daughter. Didn't get to enjoy marriage life even. Died. What a broken, broken, messed up, tossed away life. What a broken piece. No, it was a miracle. All the sufferings that he wrote, the broken experiences, he put it on a diary. And that simple diary made one of the greatest preachers in history who would probably get the most rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, one of the holiest men you ever meet, John Wesley. He mentioned about Brainerd's diary. Let every preacher read carefully the life of David Brainerd. Every preacher, including the great John Wesley, learning from an 18-year-old. Yeah. Yeah. William Carey, you know, the first missionary that went out, had the guts unlike all the other missionaries, who suffered a mentally deranged wife and then lost several children, pagan India, didn't get soul saved for many years. You know what? How did he end it up in India, throwing away his life and serving Jesus Christ? He read David Brainerd's diary. You know, Henry Martin, he was a missionary to India and Persia. But guess what? He did what William Carey did. He read David Brainerd's diary. Robert McShion, he was an apostle to the Jews. 
and became a missionary to minister to these people because guess what? He read David Brainerd's diary. <clears throat> David Brainerd supported missionaries. Can you imagine all these soul, lost souls in India, Persia, Jews, who are hard to reach for Christ? That they went to heaven, they got saved because these missionaries read David Brainerd's diary. David Brainerd didn't win these people in India to Christ. He never led the people in Persia to Christ or the Jews. He had nothing. Just a broken life. Yeah. Just a broken, wasted, cast aside life. No, it was used to save somebody in India years later. Wow. You know why God is breaking you? To support someone. Amen. I don't see the support. That's right. You're not supposed to see the support. You're supposed to support somebody that's on an invisible plane years later on the other side of the world. Someone that you just bump across and then you never heard from again. It's those people. Amen. My fifth point is seeds. Seeds. You know what the miracle is when you go through a broken life for God? Is so that you can have these seeds that will produce fruit. You know, the thing is, is that a lot of us want fruits for the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want fruits for the Lord. I want to feel like that I've accomplished my task and bring something at the feet of Jesus Christ. And some of you might feel like I have a lot of catching up to do. And then for some weird reason, you come to church and then bad things start happening to you. And then you get overrun with guilt that, man, there's a lot of things that I want to do in the church. And it's already hard enough for me to drag myself to church with all these broken things going on in my life. When I was lost and I was not saved and I was into the world, I didn't have these bad stuff happening to me. Why is it happening right now? Because God granted your desire. He's producing the fruit that you finally wanted. Amen. That you felt guilty, that you want to catch up and you want to bring to the Lord. Some of you just overexert yourself and you feel like you should do more for the church and you say, is there anything that I can do, Pastor? Anything I can do, Pastor? You know what my answer is? Yeah, let God break you. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. And then you'll produce fruit for him. John chapter 12, verse 24 says, Verily, verily. You know what that means? That means truly. That means it is a matter of fact. And he said it twice. As a matter of fact, this is a truth. Verily, verily, I say twice. I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Hallelujah. Bless his holy name. Praise the Lord. That's common sense. Grain cannot be produced until it first is a dead seed that falls into the ground. And that's why Tertullian once said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. You know, Alexander McKay, I can imagine, understood that when he was a missionary to Uganda. Going over there, there were a bunch of Muslims who hated Christianity. And you know what they did with little children? It was a nightmare. They took scores of Christians, sliced off their arms, and slowly roasted them in the fire, including three boys, oldest is 15 and youngest is 12, being mutilated and burned. And one of those children crying out, please do not cut off my arms. Only throw me in the fire. What a nightmare. What is McKay going into? We went over there to become broken to those Muslims who needed the Lord. And you know what? He kept getting pressured. Come back home. Don't be over there. It's a nightmare. The case like, no, this is where God called me to be. And he ended up homeless and died. Broken ministry, broken life, broken man, broken mission. The king of Uganda's son got saved. Wow. wow. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know what happened? At the Capitol today stands a beautiful church. Wow. And on that place stands a cross. 
put by 70,000 Uganda Christians. Why? Casting over the memory of the boys who died and burned to death over there. 70,000! And all you look at is the 70,000. You're not looking at the seed. Yeah. Yeah. You know what you're looking at? You're looking at 70,000 fruits. What a beautiful garden. What delicious fruits. Oh, how did you get all that for the Lord? If only I can bring that to the feet of Jesus. You're not looking at the seeds. Yeah. You're not looking at the broken sweats, the broken tears, the broken life and the broken hours spent, the broken ground tilled. You're not looking at that. You know why God's breaking you? So that you can become a miracle. Imagine I told you five years from now, you're going to bring a lot of fruits to the Lord. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that uplift your spirit yeah. and you would go, wow, Pastor, I, that, that sounds great, but I don't think so. Imagine I went to Brother Daniel. I told Brother Daniel over there, hey, brother, guess what? Three years later, you're going to bring a lot of fruits for Jesus Christ. You wouldn't believe me right now, brother, as much as I wouldn't even believe myself if I heard that from me. But, you know, God is saying that yeah. to Daniel, to you. You know what God is saying? Yeah, a couple of years from now, you're going to bring a lot of fruit for me. How praise the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Great. And God's like, that's why I need to break you. Yeah. 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 Let's do this. Yes. You ready? Let's do this. Yeah. Let's go preach it, bro. My sixth point is success. Success. And that is the miracle is that your life is a success. Now, if there's any successful thing in your life that you can boast about and show off to others, Remember this, how did you get that success? Mm -hmm. Or did some of you never experience that yet? I dare say that the greater percentage, probably 60% or higher in this church, could tell you of stories of their success that the Lord pulled them through. And it did not come without a cost. It did not come without being broken. Think about all the blessings. What, what, what's that job to you? You know, is it because of your intellect? <laughs> the degree, the diploma that you have? A uh, successful family life and a beautiful home and the life that you have? Can you really say that's all from you? If you recall what God did for you? You went through something broken, didn't you? Yeah. And that's what being broken does. It gives you success. What kind of success? I'll give you scripture for it. You want scripture? Yeah, give me scripture. I'll give you scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yeah. You live in godliness. Mm -hmm. You increase heavenly mindedness. And you increase your reign with Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. You get blessings. Spiritual, physical, mental, financial. You name it. James chapter 1, verse 12. You're able to give glory, honor, and praise to God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. You become more like Jesus Christ. That's a huge success. 1 Peter 2, 21. You draw closer to God's Spirit and know His presence. 1 Peter 4, 14. I think that's success. If that's not the definition of success, I don't know what your definition of success is. You know how you get all this? Being broken. And those verses are evidence. If you don't believe me, you go back home and look at those verses right now. And those verses will tell you that suffering produces those successes. Amen. You know, the vine clings very close to the oak tree during the fiercest of storms. And then when you look at that vine, if the wind blows toward... Uh, the hidden side of the vine. If the vine is on one side of the oak tree and the wind is blowing toward the vine tree where it's being behind, where it's behind the oak, guess what? The vine is covered and protected. The wind don't hit the vine. The vine still stays close to the oak. Why? Because the oak tree is protecting that vine. But then that wind, you know, that crafty little wind, it might just change direction and go the other side. And then guess what? It hits the exposed side of the vine. But guess what? That vine still clings close to the oak tree. And you might say, why is that? 
When that wind blows against that vine, that vine dangles and clings even closer to the oak tree. Yeah. And you know what? That oak tree is the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. my friend. And that wind is the devil. And that devil, he just keeps blowing on your life. You know, here's, oh, a great health. And then, and breaks it. Oh, what a happy family life. And the devil goes, breaks it. Oh, the church is growing well and we're doing great things for the Lord. And the devil goes, breaks it. And he's just blowing at you and blowing at you. And oh God, it hurts. And man, guess what? At times when you cry out to the Lord, you say, Jesus, be my oak tree. And Jesus Christ, yes, sir. And then he goes right in front of that wind. And no matter how much the devil blows, that oak tree is strong and blocks out the wind. Amen. And that vine is delivered from the wind. Praise the Lord. Success. Amen. So then the wind says, all right. I'm going to go around that oak tree. I'm going to go around Jesus' divine protection. I'm going to ask Jesus' permission. Hey, let me attack that individual this time. Don't cover his back. And Jesus, God says, okay, go ahead. I grant you permission. And that devil goes on that vine which is you. And that vine which is you, you go, oh, oak tree. Cover for me. And that oak tree does not cover you. And you go, oh, Jesus, protect me. And that oak tree does not cover your back. And that vine, which is you, cry out, failure, failure, failure. But that vine is tangling closer to that oak tree. And that oak tree, Jesus says, success, success, success. Amen. That's good. But I'm being exposed. You're letting the devil hit me. And God says, that's the point, child. I would never let the devil get to you if I had a purpose of success. Amen. 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 You know why God's breaking you? You have a lot of successful things in your life. And if you have a lot of successful things in your life, you're not really looking back at the times he broke you. You've been too proud. My seventh point is spirituality. Spirituality. What's so miraculous is that a fleshly, carnal, wicked being like you become a very spiritual person for the Lord. And that is something unthinkable that I don't think I'll ever understand except a miracle. That's it. First Peter chapter 5, verse 10 says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus... After that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. You know, if you see these great giants of preachers, and you can name them. You can name Peter Ruckman, David Peacock, and uh, you can name out William Grady, Gail Ripplinger. You can name out fundamentalist big giants of preachers with independent Baptist churches back in the old days. But all these names that you hear, the Great Awakening Revival preachers, you hear Charles Finney, you hear Adoniram Judson, you hear D.L. Moody, and then you hear about Alexander McKay, and you hear about these great preachers back then. And you go, wow, they're spiritually mature people. If you ever meet one of these preachers, you get that sensation. You get that feeling. You go, man, that person's a spiritually mature person. Wow. You know, that didn't come without a cost. That didn't come without God breaking that person. That person ain't the mature, proud, strong individual that you see. If you look back in the past, he was nothing but a broken person like you. You know, it's just common sense. Didn't you know that? It's common sense in life. Struggles unleash your hidden potential and gift that you didn't know you had before. You know, most of, the, most of the psalm were born in difficulty, if you read it. Most of the epistles in the New Testament from Paul you read were written in prison. No. Pilgrim's Progress, that became a famous classic, was written by Bunyan from jail. The great Florence Nightingale, too, she was too ill to move from her bed but she reorganized the hospital system in England. Semi-paralyzed and under the constant menace of apoplexy, 
Pasteur was tireless in his attack on disease. Beethoven composed his chief oratorio when he became so deaf. John Milton created his sublimest poem of the ages when he had become stone blind. Walter Scott wrote his famous Lay of the Last Minstrel when he was kicked by a horse and confined to his house for many days. During the greater part of his life, American historian Francis Parkman suffered so acutely that he could not work for more than five minutes at a time. His eyesight was so wretched that he could scrawl only a few gigantic words on a manuscript turned out to be 20 magnificent volumes of history. In 1962, Victor and Mildred Gortzel published a revealing study of 413 famous and exceptionally gifted people. All right, we're going to find a connection with all these famous gifted people, 413 of them. What's the common thread? They were just born talented. Man, they were just super people. They were just the common thread overcame suffering in order to become who they are. Why is God breaking you? To mature you. To spiritually empower you. Greater, much more of a grown-up. You know, I think this. You are much more of a grown-up now compared to probably three years ago for some of you. Four years ago, five years ago. Some of you ten years ago. My eighth point is supremacy. Supremacy. And that's the, the most magnificent thing about God's miracle is His inner power. And that power is something so coveted that not even the devils of hell could even have and not even Satan no matter how much he tried. And that coveted power of God you can have in your hand you see a glimpse of that when the preacher gets up on that pulpit and you see a glimpse of that power. You see a sh glimpse of that power with a martyr who's singing a hymn burning at the stake. You see a glimpse of that power just from a person's presence walking during fellowship or just by the very words of his prayer. And that supremacy, that magnificence, that power, where does it come? It came from my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Amen. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. You know, one of the people that I'm about to explain over here could understand a bit of that on how to receive power from God. He was scheduled to speak at the Chicago Moody's Founders Week. And what happened was he was reading a letter from Moody Bible Institute. And during that time, he read the letter that said, Brethren, we must come to Founders Week with broken hearts if the world is to receive a blessing through us. And that speaker who read that letter from Moody Bible Institute, he was convicted and then he went on his knees and then he said, Oh God, I don't know how I can be a blessing to people, but I need that. Whatever it takes, Lord, will you give me a broken heart? And then at the time when he was scheduled to speak, he received a phone call overseas. And when he picked up that phone, the person told him, your wife died of a heart attack at 1 p.m. His heart was broken. Lost his wife. Lost something precious in his life. You know what the speaker did with tears? God, you're horrible. That's not what I meant when I prayed to give me a broken heart. Like some of you. You know what? He didn't say that. I'll tell you what he said. Lord, I will go. You give me the grace and I will speak at Founders Week as planned. You answered my prayer more than I expected. 
but I'm going to accept your answer, Father. When he went on that pulpit, the power of God manifested from his life and became what he called it the first step to victory, which would have otherwise been a crushing defeat. My friend, when you look at this pulpit right here, we see the, it's just a piece of wood, you know, I'll be honest, nothing miraculous, nothing divine, but there is something of a miracle behind it. There's a presence there. It has a history of God's magnificent power manifested. It's so amazing. With a piece of a, with, with just a book, no technology, yeah. no slides, yeah. nothing fancy, yeah. not a glass podium, just a wooden pulpit and a book on top of it. And just God's man speaking behind it. The Lord can use something miraculous, divine. And you see that practically every Sunday. Amen. And that magnificent comes from someone being broken. Usually the greatest sermons you will hear is because someone was broken. You know what? Some of you are perhaps too comfortable, too hard-hearted and still. And maybe some of you need to be broken. And you need to come down here on the altar and say, God, I, I have no miracle in my life. I have no, nothing in my life story that I can boast about you. I need a miracle. So will you break me? Some of you are already broken, but you're regretting it. And you're saying, Lord, take away the broken pieces. You know what you should do? Lord, keep me still. Right here. In the broken pieces and will you use me? I'll tell you what, don't break, don't waste. Do not waste your broken peace. I don't know what broken thing you're going through right now, but don't waste it. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. Is there anyone broken here today? Do you hear the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart? Maybe you need to come down and shh, bring your shattered, broken life right over here. And let the master pick up the pieces and mold you and fashion you, perfect you into a beautiful fine vessel. I don't know if you have any miracle in your life, my friend, but if you have no miracle in your life, you're just as wasteful and vain as that unbelieving atheist who can never believe in miracles. I cannot boast that I have so many miracles, but I sure can tell you about some miracles at least. And boy, boy, God is something else. You know how that came? He broke me. He broke me. Did He ever break you before? Brother, sister, did He ever break you one time before? And when he broke you that once, didn't you run away? Didn't you say, no, Lord? And guess what? The miracle didn't come, right? If you want the miracle, you need the Lord to break you. If the Lord already broke you, you need to stay there. You need to let him keep molding you. You need to let him keep fashioning you. The Lord doesn't take ode to joy to make your life miserable. And your life is not a forever process of breaking without any miracle, without any blessing, without any joy or result that comes out. You know, you got to look at that miracle that the Lord can use. You need to look at the power of God that He can manifest out of your life. That comes from being broken. So let Him break you. Let him keep breaking you. And guess what? Like I told you, he's, he's not a God that makes you miserable with living brokenness consistently. He only breaks to perfect. That's all. He doesn't break out of a whim. He doesn't break 24-7. He breaks only to perfect. 
What a wonderful father. You know, he only breaks to give you safety. He only breaks so that salvation can result one day. He only breaks to give you strength. He only breaks so that you can support somebody in your life. He only breaks so that you can have some seeds to plant and to produce fruit. He only breaks so that you can become a success. He only breaks so you can be full of spirituality. He only breaks to give you supremacy. Father God, I pray that today's preaching has made us broken, Father. I think some of us have been too proud and maybe the sermon gave a little crack in our hearts. I pray that the crack will be complete and we will shatter. And those of us who are shattered, will you perfect us now? Will you have us realize that we don't have to feel constantly broken and hurt, but that we can see the blessing, we can see the fruit, Will you encourage us today? Will you comfort our hearts? Comfort our broken hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.